Airbnb clone project. And basically, we are going to try to understand what this project is about and how to approach it if you haven't done it yet. Um, basically, this is like the first main web project that we are doing. So all the projects that we have done so far isn't related to having a website. This is the first one that is related to having a website. And to be able to accomplish this project or be able to build a clone of the Airbnb website, you would have to, there are certain things that you need to appreciate to be able to do, okay? And as a software engineer, the peculiar thing that you would need to know about, which we haven't come across yet, so probably ask me more about. There is something we call the software, let me make it smaller, to the software development life cycle. Software development life cycle, which is mostly abbreviated as the SDLC. So if you come across it anywhere, and basically this is like a framework that indicates exactly what happens when it comes to building a software. Okay, so there are a lot of processes that take place when you want to build a software. And even though there are variations of it, the common form that you find is that to build a software, you would first start with planning. So that's the first stage of the software development life cycle. You start with planning. Then after you're done planning, you do what we call analysis. Okay, analysis or some of them will say uh, requirement analysis, so requirement analysis. Then the third one, after you are done with your analysis and everything, you would go into the design phase where you design or come up with the design related details, okay, regarding the software that you're going to build. Then the fourth stage to do the implementation stage, implementation stage. That is basically where the actual building is. The actual building of the, the software is there. Then after you are done building the software, what you are going to do is you are going to test. So the fifth stage is testing. Then the final stage is mostly maintenance, okay? So the final stage is mostly maintenance, but then it's a cycle. Maintenance is a cycle. That means even from the maintenance stage, you still keep planning. And if there is need to go through it again, I mean, do more analysis, you may be doing feature updates and things. So this is a whole cycle that you go through every time. And as a software engineer, it's something that you must know. Um, uh, when you are working in a company where you have a lot of uh, specialization, everyone has what they are expected to do. You may find yourself in just one or two of these parts. Let me usually testing. Some people will include uh, integration, integration here. Then before maintenance, others will include deployment. So depending on which one you are using. But then if mostly for the planning, if you are working in a big company, the planning may not even get to your side. Like your bosses or the superior will do all the planning. Some people will be called on to do the analysis and requirements. And depending on what exactly you are responsible for. So when you come to the design part, mostly to develop a software, they will come up with what we call the uh, is it software specification requirements. Yes, I think so. Then they may also come up with what we call the design uh, document requirements. Okay, so that is also there. But then in this particular case that we are building the clone of an LBMB project, the whole thing is like you are building your own website from, uh, from scratch, okay? So the planning, all of these things is on you. 
The fortunate thing is that this is a clone, and because it is a clone, most of the work has been done for us. We just need to go and understand what has already been done. Okay? Then we will now replicate what has been done. If you don't understand what has been done, you can't replicate it. If we were supposed to build our own project without constructing the clone of something, we will now have to sit down and do the planning ourselves. We have to do the analysis, see what requirement, what tech stack are we going to use, come up with a design. So sometimes even here, we have to do what we call wireframing, uh, prototyping, and UI, UX design, research, and things. Okay, so all of those things will come in. Then eventually, after you've gotten the design that you want, you've gotten, you have in mind exactly what you want to be building, then you come down to write the code, which is the four, that's the part four. Okay, then when it comes to implementation itself, we look at for such a case that is a web app for a web app we are looking at three major parts of the web app when you are building we are looking at one the front end of the web app as a front end design we'll look at uh, what we refer to as the back end design then we'll look at the database the database design database for our specific case, we are here to look at databases. I think in the coming weeks, that's what we are going to be looking at. So for now, we would call this storage and we are going to be using it, the data that we are collecting in a file. The back end is like the logic of the whole website. At the end of the day, if somebody visits the Airbnb website and clicks a button, what actually happens? If they create an account, what actually happens beneath it that they are not seeing? So that is your uh, the work that you are going to do for the back end. Then the front end is just the design that you are going to see and be able to interact with a website. So unfortunately, we are not yet, we haven't done front end design yet. So for that matter, in this specific case, we are asked to use a console to represent our front end. So we are going to build our application as a console application. That means that whichever user that is going to interact with our application is going to interact through a console. So the interface they will see is a console. In relation to how web app is built, we will say that is our front end. Okay, so in this specific uh, program that we are building or app that we are building, we have our front end to be a console application. And this console application in Python, we are going to achieve that with the help of a model called the CMD model. The CMD model is going to help us achieve this console application at the front end of it. With the back end, we've done a lot of Python so far. And we are going to use the OOP concept in Python that we have learned already. That is the object-oriented programming concept that we have done already. Please, if, if you are not speaking, kindly mute yourself. Otherwise, there are some distractions. If you unmute yourself, I expect you to either ask a question, make a contribution, anything of that sort, okay? So kindly mute yourself if you are not speaking. Thank you. All right, so with the back end, we are looking at using the OOP concepts that we've learned, building classes, creating methods, and calling these methods, class attributes, like all those things, inheritance, polymorphism, encapsulation, all those things that you have learned, which we are going to delve into details in subsequent uh, PLD sessions, but then this focus is on our project. Then when we come to the database, in our case, since we are not working with database, we are looking at file storage. So let me put it here, file storage. So with a file storage in Python, we are supposed to uh, use a model called the JSON model. So we use a JSON model to help us store the data that we are generating inside a file, okay? So how many models so far? We've talked about the CMD model. 
we talked about JC model. Great. Then, after we have built this application, that is the stage four that we are, okay? Fortunately for us, it's a clone that we are building. So I said what? The planning has been done already. Requirements analysis has been done already. Design has been done already. So we are to build. Ours is to build. And to test. So there are two major things that we are doing. We are going to build and test. So the last part that we are going to do is the testing part. Okay? Testing. Testing. So with testing in Python, we are going to use... Hi, Christian. Okay. In, in testing, we are going to use a model called unit tests. Unit test model. So these are the requirements that we've been asked to use in order to build the whole application that we are building. We need to know about the CMD model. So when you are learning Python, you didn't learn specifically about these individual models, okay? But then, once you know how to uh, use a model in Python, you should be able to assess any model, learn about it, and be able to use it to implement anything you want. So right now, we have to go and read about a CMD model, what it is used for, and how to use it, how to implement it, for us to be able to implement the front end of our project. Then we also have to learn about the JSON model to help us appreciate how to store our data. Then we will learn about the unit test to help us what test the program or write various test cases for the projects that we are working on. And all of these parts, like every part is very important. Some of us, we tend to ignore some, like testing is not important. It's very important. There are even uh, specialization sort of. So if you work for a bigger company, there could be a case that you as a software engineer, you actually work in a testing team. And all that you do is to write test cases for the software that you produce in that company. Okay. If you are working for a startup or you are working for yourself, you will find yourself doing multiple of these things. That is why as we are developing ourselves as full stack engineers, we need to appreciate all of these things. So let's go on. Now, the most important part of our application is the back end. We need to build our back end. After we build the back end, we can now connect the back end to the storage so that any data that is being processed in the back end can be stored. When we process the data and store it, we should also be able to now display the data in a way that will be meaningful to the user. So we we'll work on the front end. Depending on which company you're working with, what your requirements are, whether you're working alone or you're working with a team, all of these things may be done concurrently or one after the other. If you are building, some people prefer to build the front end first, others prefer to build the back end first, others prefer to build the database, okay? But obviously, the testing is like the last part. I mean, not necessarily the last, last part, but then you should have something to be able to test it, okay? So what we are going to do in our case, let me see, the back end. But then before we'll be able to build the back end, we have to analyze. Remember that we should have done planning, analysis, and this. We have to analyze the Airbnb websites. Anal analysis of the Airbnb website because that's what we want to build and know exactly what is there. So when I go to Airbnb website, what can I do there? What is the purpose of that website? You and I know that Airbnb is a platform where you can book an Airbnb. Now you've gotten to that status where you can say you are booking an Airbnb and everybody understands it. Okay, but what it basically means is that you are booking a room that you are going to stay in for maybe a short period of time or depending on what your requirements are and there are specifications, the room that you want, how many people in the room accommodate, anything like a hotel, where you are going to book a hotel. So there are things that we need to know about it. For example, 
we need to know that on that website, we'll be required to create an account. So we should have a user account. This user should be able to create an account, add what are they going to add. So if you are the only one planning these things, when you know that, okay, a user should be able to create an account, then now you start thinking, if I am going to store the user details in the database, what are the fields that I'm going to store for this given user? Okay, so do I need, let's say, name? Do I need an email of the person? What else do I need? Uh, a unique ID. So let's collect a unique ID. Uh, what else do I need? Where they come from? How long they are going to stay? No. no. So this is not the booking part. This is just the account. Okay. So we can focus on things that will identify them when they created the account. So accounts created dates. Then anytime they update the account, so you may collect the updated dates. And you, you decide exactly what to write. So the best would be for us to go to Airbnb, to their website, and try creating an account and see all the integrity details that they require. All the details that they require of us, then we will be aware of. But for this project, fortunately for us, all those things have been done for us, and we are told what fails to go after. Okay, so you and I are not going to worry ourselves about whether we need a name, the email, the unique ID, whatever we need. All of those things have been mentioned for us. So we just need to know that if I'm creating a user account, there are a few things that I need, and here are they. So apart from having a user account, we may create uh, what reviews. So there could be a reviews model. There could be a place model to uh, list a place. If somebody wants to list their room, there could be a place model. There could be for each place too, we are looking at the amenities that are present in that place. So these are some of the models that you are going to be creating. But then it all depends on how the uh, platform that you are building works. Okay. So now... The best way to know how to build something on your own is by learning how others have built this. So we are currently learning how Airbnb built this. And this is the process that we thought about, okay, what, what would we be looking out for on our website? And some of these things we are talking about, we are talking about reviews, we are talking about place, we are talking about amenities. So to implement this in Python and to make it easy, since we are using the OOP, concept, what it means is that all of these models that we are talking about, we're actually going to be implementing them as what? Classes. They are going to be implementing these as classes so that anytime a user account is created, we'll just call a user class. And within a class, what do we have? We have attributes and methods. The attributes are like providing uh, information, details, then the method is like the behavior or actions, what can be done, okay? So for instance, let's say when I create an amenity, uh, 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 <laughs> let me call it an instance here, since we have some knowledge in OOP. If you have created a class, okay? A class is just a blueprint that we use so if I say I've created an amenity class, all that it means is that I have a blueprint that I follow anytime that I'm creating something relating to amenity, okay? And anytime I create something with that blueprint, I call it the instance of the class, or technically you call it an object of the class. Okay, so when I want to create an object of this class, I can go ahead and create it. Then I call any of the methods and use any of the attributes as and when I want. So for each of the models here or objects that we are going to create or the classes, these fields that we are going to be storing in our databases, in our case, in our storage or our file, they are going to be the attributes of the class. 
So if I ask you what are the attributes of the user account or user class, we are looking at the name, the email, the unique ID, the created ad time, the updated ad time, all those things become what the attribute of the class. But then we should also be able to see the method of the class. So there is a common thing that most web application would do. We call it the crude or crud, depending on who taught you English, which where C stands for, C stands for create. So I can create a user. I can create a review. I can create a place. I can create an amenity inside my database. Okay, and how will I be able to do that? With the help of the classes that I'm writing, I'll be able to do that. Then I can, R, R is for read. So I can read data that I have stored. I can show this data. If the user wants to see their details, their profile account, their bookings, the reviews that they've left, the amenities that are available inside a given room, they are going into what read so i can read information that i have stored then u is for u is for updates once i've stored data i can always go in and update it then finally d is for delete so most commonly when you are building a web application these four actions are things that you are going to be doing often so it means that we have to create methods that will permit us to create objects, read objects, update objects, or delete objects. So these are going to be some of the methods that we are going to be creating for that matter. All right. Any questions so far? Any questions? I hope you are following. Okay, so let's see. We'll realize that for some of these, like reviews, for reviews to, I definitely need, in fact, when you are storing data in a database, hopefully from next week, cohort seven members will start learning about databases, so that will be covered soon. There is, in, in this case, we are going to be using what we call a relational database because these things are linked in one way and we want to connect them based on the links. And then let me not even go there. What you have to take note of is that for each data that you are storing, there has to be a unique ID that you can use to identify it with. So if we go through all of them, you realize that each of these, we are going to have a unique ID field in the storage or attribute for it. Apart from the unique ID, we'll also have the time that it was updated or the time that it was created. So essentially what I'm saying right now is that there are some attributes that will run through all the classes that you're going to create. They are given attributes that will run through all the classes that we are going to create. Then... There are methods like this, create, read, hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Hello, doctor. Hello, yes. good evening. Are you saying something? Good evening. No, no, oh, oh, sorry about that, sorry. Okay, okay, sure. All right. So there are some just as there are attributes that run throughout all the classes that we are going to create as we have just realized there are some methods that will also run through for instance for each method we are going to create something we are going to read something we are going to update something and we are going to delete something because all of these are available in each of the classes we can abstract that and create one big class. That will become the backbone of every other class that we are going to be creating. Okay? So we decided to call that main class base model. So this is a class that we are going to create. And by now, you know how to create a class in Python. 
So this is the class that we are going to create. And inside this class, what are we going to do? We are going to, see, I thought I was in my terminal. We are going to define attributes that are common amongst all the classes. Then we'll also define, define methods that are common among all the classes. So that's basically what we are going to do inside this class, uh, base model class. Then what it means is that when we begin to create any of the other classes, say the user class, all that we have to do is to make this user class inherit from the base class. As soon as we make the user class inherit from the base class, it inherits all the base class, the, yeah, let me call it that way, the base class attributes. It will also inherit all the base class methods. Then, since there are some attributes that will be unique to just the user class, for instance, if we are st storing an email, we can't store an email for the place. The place doesn't have an attribute called email. Amenity will not have an attribute called email, but Amenity can have an attribute called quantity. Quantity. User name or user class cannot have an attribute called quantity. So there are some of the attributes that are unique to specific classes. So if I come to this class, I'm then going to now declare all the unique attributes of this class. And if there is a method that is also supposed to be unique to this class, I'll declare the unique methods of this class. Give me a second, I'm coming. Okay. Sorry. Let me move this here. All right. So we are going. Now we build a base model that contains all the details, I mean, the attributes that are common for all the classes, the methods that are common for all the classes. Then we come and build each of them. Each of the, in fact, since most of the implementation are, for this specific project, most of the implementation is in the base model. All the methods that we need is inside the base model. So you are going to define all your methods inside the base model. Then as soon as you come to create the subclasses, this, let's say, I mean, all that you are going to be doing in here is inheriting from the base model, then passing what uh, the unique attributes, that is all. As soon as you pass your unique attributes here, sorry, I meant attributes. As soon as you pass your unique attributes here, they inherit everything from the base model and you are done with that. So all that you need to focus more on is building the uh, base model to work exactly how it's supposed to work. So that any of them that inherit from it will also work that same way. So we can now go ahead and create for all of these. And in fact, all of them, the things that we needed to create I mean, the subclasses that we needed to create, they have all been provided for us. So you can look at them and go ahead and create them. After this is done, the next thing is our, our storage. How do we store the files? And the data that we'll be playing with, remember, everything in Python is what? Everything in Python is anyone to answer that everything in Python is no. an thank you object. it's an object everything in Python is an object so in your base model the data you are collecting if you want to go and store it 
it is an object. Like it's in the form of an object. So going to store it, it means that if you don't do anything about it, you are going to store it as an object. The challenge is that when you store the data as an object, obviously storing it in the file will be converted into a string. The next time you are pulling it from the file, you are going to get your object in the form of a string. It's not easy to work with an object in the form of a string. So it is not advisable for you to store the data in the form of an object in a file. Because when you need it, it will be difficult for you to use it. The other reason too is that this data that you are collecting, you may not be the only person using that data. Somebody somewhere, probably you develop this thing into an API that others can call on their front end applications to use the data you have. Or that same data that you are collecting into a file, you may want to use some analytic tool to analyze it. But unfortunately, if you stored it as a Python object, most of those uses become useless. Like no one can use it outside Python or Python. No one can use it outside Python. Okay. For that matter, there is something that we need to do. We need to prepare this object for storage. Prepare the object for storage. Pardon me for the spelling mistakes. Object for storage. Okay, and how do we do that? We've realized that the best way to store such data is to convert it to JSON strings and store them in files. The reason is that it is easy for us to convert JSON strings back to Python objects. It's easy. So if I prepared my object for storage, I converted it into a JSON string and stored it in a file. Anytime that I need a file, I just go and call it. I mean, I go and pull out the data, read the data in that file, and I'm able to get back the JSON string, which I can easily convert. Remember I mentioned something about a model that we are going to be using called the JSON model. So with the help of the JSON model, we can always convert our JSON string back to a Python object. Then the other advantage is that now that we are storing it in the form of a JSON object, or sorry, a JSON string in a file, we can do anything with any other programming language on the data that we are storing. So we can have our application as an API that others will be importing the data from to use to build their own front end. We could have data analytics team using our data uh, use via different softwares or programming languages to analyze the data that we are storing. Okay, so the process of converting our Python object into the JSON format that we can store so that we can easily access any time that we want is called serialization. Those of you who hear about serialization and you don't understand, it's basically converting this Python object in, in the context of what we are doing. It's basically converting this Python object that you have gotten into a format that can easily be stored and retrieved at any time. And also into a form that can be used across various places. So that is serialization. Once we've been able to serialize the data, we've stored it as a JSON string inside a file. Anytime that we need it back, we just have to grab our what, our string, the JSON string from the file. So we open the file, read what is there. After reading it, we can then convert it back into a Python object. Doing that is the opposite of serialization. So we call that deserialization. All right. So since we now realize that this serialization, deserialization thing, converting JSON to Python, it actually isn't directly related to any of these classes that we have already. 
the base model class, the user class, the amenity class. It has nothing to do with them. So then we go ahead to create a different class for it. Storage, file storage class. So we call that the file storage class. We create that class, sorry. And this file storage class will be responsible for managing what the attributes related to the file that we are going to store. Attributes related to file. Then methods related to file. Remember that we are working with a file and there are things that we can do or we want to, actions that we want to take on the file, okay? So methods related to the file as well. Even the process of converting from the Python object to the JSON string, we are going to create a method to help us do that. All right. So by doing this, we capture all of them under file storage. And file storage will help us achieve that goal. Please give me a few seconds. Okay. Yes. Yes. Any any questions? I'm going to the next page. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? Can you all hear me? No one has a question. Come again. Uh, will these notes be made available to us? Okay, okay, sure. So once once we are done, I'll save it as a, a PDF and make it available. Sure. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. yes good evening. Uh, you're welcome. Um, all right. So let's go to the next page. What have we tackled so far? We, we've looked at a base met model class. And we said that's the backbone for all the extra classes that we'll be creating. But then we also needed a file storage class to handle the storage aspect of it, of the file for us. Okay. So the biggest challenge that you are going to be facing is how you are going to link the base model such that is going to be able to, I mean, link the base model with the file storage. In fact, in your own implementation, you could have decided that, hey, let me put the, I'm not going to create a new class called file storage. Every other thing that I need for my file storage, I'll capture it in my base model. Hi, Vesta. Hi, Vesta. Please, if, if you are mute, I expect you to say, like you're about to say something. Otherwise, Vesta, are you saying something? All right, sure. Okay, so if you are doing your own implementation, you could have decided that, okay, I'm going to use everything inside this model, but then that's not the most appropriate thing. When we are doing OOP, the, the, the advantage of doing OOP or creating classes is that it makes our code reusable. So today you are building Airbnb clone and you need file storage. What if tomorrow you are building a different project and you need file storage? Now, because we've created a class, a separate class that handles storage in files, uh, yes, storage in files. Anytime we are going to build any Python project that requires same, all we need to do is to come and grab the code that we use for the class. Okay, so it makes our code reusable. It becomes way easy. That is why we have put the file storage into a separate class. But then how are they linked? How am I going to link it? So for instance, inside my base model, inside my base model, I am going to create uh, so inside this class, I'm going to create a method called, so let's create a method called save. 
And what does this method do? This method is responsible for saving an instance an instance of the class into the file. So that's what it's responsible for doing. But then, when I call it, you and I know that what is actually going to handle the file storage is the file storage class that we've created. That's what I'm saying, that we could have done everything in here, but then we've decided that, or per the instructions that were given, we're supposed to create the file storage class separately. So what you are going to do is that inside the save model here, you would have to call this file storage class. So you have to make a call to it so that it save whatever you are passing to it. So here we have self. Then because we've defined most of them as class attributes, the class attribute will be passed through the self variable down here. Or even because the self uh, class attribute, we can receive any sort of attributes down here. Okay. So let's assume that for each of them, we needed the attribute, uh, we needed the ID, we needed created at time, we needed updated at time. So for those of you who don't know or who didn't know, in order to do the time for the created at and updated at time, we are going to use a model called the date time model. Some of these things, when you start working, you don't know them off head. It is, you want to implement something, go to Google, search. I want to implement this in Python. What should I do? Then they suggest a model for you. Go and search on the model. In fact, you can even use the official Python documentation to read on the model to know how this model is implemented. For instance, if you are using the daytime model, how do I get the current dates? Okay, so you go to Google and find out how to get the current date from the daytime model. And you come and implement it to get the current date for creating or updating. So if we call the save method of our base model, we expect it to go and save the instance that we have created with these details or any extra details that we have passed to it, provided it is being called by a class, a subclass, or a class that's inherited from this parent class. So to do that, we would therefore have to call the safe method of this file storage. Okay, that means that wherever you are implementing your base model, you would have to import this class, the file storage class. So depending on where you store it, maybe it is in a file called file storage, file storage dot py. Okay, so you don't have to bring py, sorry. So we could import it this way or there are several forms that we can import it. So we could also do from this file storage, I want to import, I want to import file storage. Okay. Then you create an instance of this file storage in here and use it to do the storing. But then with the implementation that we were given, we created kind of a universal instance of file storage so that we can access it anywhere we are. So when I come in here, I don't have to come and create an instance. If I call it this way, I would have to come here and create an instance of it and say storage is equal to file storage like this, create an instance like this. Then now I can go and call the method on this instance and I'll do storage dot save and pass self to it so that it picks the details here. All the details here, it passes it to this storage to go and store it. 
Okay, but in the current implementation, what we did was that inside a given, I'm, I'm trying to be very careful. So <laughs> pardon me when I don't want to talk about things. But then what we have right now inside a given file called underscore underscore init underscore underscore py, we were asked to create, we were asked to create an instance of the file model in there or instance of the file class in there. So inside this script, okay, you'll find that you would have imported or say what I did here. Let me copy that. You would find that you have imported file storage and you have created an instance of that called storage is equal to file storage like this okay and the good thing is that anytime the application run like any module that is running within this package so for those of you who have learned more about i mean by now we should have all learned about it those in core seven when we take a model a model is basically a python script that we can import to use in a different location or in a different script, okay? So that is a model. It's basically a Python script that you can import and use in a different script. So essentially, almost any Python script that you write can be used as a model, provided it is imported and used in a different script, it becomes a model automatically. Then a collection of these models in a given directory can be termed as a package. So a package is basically a collection of models in a giving directory then interestingly a package should have this file underscore underscore in it so we say a magic uh, file or the yes magic file underscore underscore in it uh, underscore underscore dot py it should have this in there this file in there to show that this is the package Inside this file, you can put things that should run anytime the model, any of the models inside this package is accessed. Does that make sense? Inside this, what we have done here, okay, we know that this file, all that is doing is making sure that that directory that contains our models is seen as, um, seen as a package. But then, Inside it, we are instantiating the file storage class. For that matter, anytime the model, file storage model is used anywhere, this instance will be created. And that means we will have access to it. We can import storage directly. So we don't necessarily have to go and import a file, which is, oh, I didn't include the import here. From file storage, import so this time around we don't need to, to go and import this whole thing we need to just import our storage and once we import storage we can use it as if we imported the whole file okay so when i come here instead of writing storage is equal to this and creating the instance i'll just go ahead and call my storage.save uh, method the save method on it and that will store the instance that has been created here is it making sense i hope quick, it is quick question sure go ahead quick question so are we saying that if i store an instance of uh, my magic uh, story, i store an instance of a class in this particular case, file storage in the init or the magic file. I do 
don't have to import. I don't have to import. Uh, what's it called? The file storage into, for instance, I, I want to use it in a base model. Um, it doesn't mean I don't have to import uh, the file storage in there and I can use it automatically without importing. Without so importing. What you are going to import is you are going to import the instance that you have created and not necessarily the class itself. You get it? Sorry. No, I, no I'm not getting it because. My my question is, uh, uh, the instance of the of the class has been created and placed inside the init inside the yes. init uh, in the magic file. I understand that part. Now I want to use it. So right now it's global to all models in in which the init is instantiating. I'm like it's in, in which the init uh, in, in which the magic file is right. So does not mean yes. I don't have to like do uh, that particular, or I can I can use it without uh, uh, without importing from the file storage or whatever? Do, do, you, do you understand my question? Like, can you can you see my screen? Hello. Hello? Yes. Can you see my screen? Kwabina, can you see my screen? So you realize that over here, I'm not importing the file storage class that I created. I'm importing the instance that I've created because the instance is available for my use. Do you get it? So if I haven't created the instance, I would have to import the uh, whole model then create an instance of the model anytime I want to use it. But then to make things simple, I've made it available because I'm going to use it widely so that I'll just import that specific one and not every one of them. I don't know, probably we've lost him with network. Okay. Um, where do we proceed to? So essentially, essentially, when it comes to the storage part, that is what we have done, okay? That's what we have done. The basic implementation is just following the instructions that you've been given. Create this, uh, this method. Create this other method. This method should do this. I don't want to get into the nitty gritties. I want to give a general overview, and if we still have time, we can then look at the basic, basic stuff, okay? as in how you create the models and I mean the classes and the methods. So now we have covered three parts, the uh, two parts, sorry. So we've covered the back end, which is the OOP part. Then we've covered the storage part, which are going to use the JSON to help us store the data and why we do it. The next thing is to cover the front end part. The front end part is what we are calling is a console application. So we have to look at how to implement a console application. For I've gotten a few people reach out to me and they are like with their current knowledge with Python, they want to be able to build something meaningful and things. Okay. And when I learned about the CMD model, I was like, okay, this means that almost everything that you have learned you can now use it to build console applications. You just need to learn how to use this model to build a console application. So let's pay particular attention to this. After you are done with this project, any of the programs that you write in Python, you can convert it, easily convert it to a console application that others can use. It's not like user friendly, obviously. Nobody wants to play with a black boss. It's not user friendly. And pretty soon we'll be learning how to write the front end using the web stack applications. I mean, using HTML, CSS, and things. But then, as we haven't yet gotten there, the CMD model is one that will help you create something that is equally useful. Okay, 
So basically, what a CMD model is, is it helps you create your own console application or your own, uh, like, like what we did with the shell application. Okay. What we did with shell was we built our own shell that we could use. It understood the commands that we were given it and things. So now we have built this whole Airbnb backend uh, with storage facility uh, abilities. But if you don't build it into the console application, if you have not added a front end to it, the problem is that no one will be able to use your program unless that person is actually a programmer, a Python developer. So if I want to create uh, something, if I want to create a user with the back end that you have written, I have to go into your code and write it out and say, for instance, if I want to create one, I have to create an instance of, say, the user model. So I'll say my user is equal to, then I'll now call the user class, then my user dot maybe update. So if you don't develop the front end of it, this is the only way someone can use the code that you have written. The person will have to understand OOP, will have to know which methods you had in there to be able to create it. And that is not a good thing. I mean, that's not something you want to show to anybody if the person is not a developer. So this time around, we want to say that when they run our program, they are greeted with this command line interface and anything at all they want. If they want to create a user, they should just say create a user. So we are building an, a console that understands a certain set of commands. So create user, I am defining what create user should do. So when somebody types create user on my console application, it's going to create a user for them. They can come and say update user and pass the user ID they want to update. So this user ID, what do I want to update? I want to update the user's first name. So I could have something like this. Then say the first name should now be changed to Obed. And my console will understand this. Compare this to what this person had to do. This person had to come and say, my user dot update, then pass this information. Okay, so the ID, the, all of these things in here. But once we create the console application, all they need to know about is the various commands. So what commands are available in my console? So for this specific case, we are supposed to create a command that can be used to create, a command that can be used to show, a command that can be used to count, a command that can be used to destroy, that is delete. And if you remember, this is similar to what we're doing here. Create, read, update, delete. Okay, it's very similar. Some of them will require a combination. So create, show, count, update. Then we have a commander for lists. Was, was there a command like that? <laughs> okay, I think so. So we'll do that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So let's stick to this command. So we are supposed to build a command line interpreter to be able to interpret all these commands. When you say create, you should know what to do. When you say show, you should know what to do. When you say count, you should know what to do. When you say destroy, like that, okay? So how then do we build it? How are we going to build it? Two things that you need to take note of to build this. First, you need to import, import. You need to import CMD. It's a model available in Python itself. So when you import CMD, you have access to it. Then, so it means that we are creating the file that we are going to use to launch it. Let's assume that I'm calling my file. I create a file called airbnb.py. Okay. And make this file executable. This means that anytime somebody wants to run this, they have to 
execute it this way, airbnb.py. Then when they call inside this file, I want to make sure that the command line will only run when the file is called by its name and not when it is imported as a model. Remember when I was explaining the model, I said any Python file at all is a model provided it is imported into another script. So we want to prevent it from executing when it is imported as a model. It should only be called. I mean, it should, should only be executed when it is called by its name. So we use the command if name. I hope I haven't forgotten this. If name is equal to main. Yes. So if name is equal to main, what this means is that I am checking that did they call me by my name, my main name, or did they import me? If they imported me, I'm not going to execute. So if they called me, then I'm going to execute. But after you have called this uh, CMD file, I left something out which I should mention. You need to create a class that will inherit the CMD class from this model. So let's create a class called my console. Okay. And this class will inherit from CMD dot CM. No, I think it's CMD. Let me confirm that. I don't really remember this. Okay, so it is dot, it's only the C that is a capital letter. So you call it like this. You create a class, class, my console, then cmd dot cmd. Once you've called this class, it's going to inherit everything from the cmd class. And you can now go ahead and use all its features. So in here, I would say, uh, Sorry, let me, let me confirm that this thing. That's this is actually my first time working with it. So yes, the CMD loop. That's what I was looking for. So we need something of this sort to call it. See, even this is supposed to be underscore underscore name. We said, let me copy this to show you that. And you don't need to memorize all of these things, okay? The more you work with them, they stick. If you don't work with them often, the very moments that you need to work with them, you just go and grab them. Oh, what's happening? I tried pasting and it's not responding. Why? Okay. Did you know? Okay, sure. So here, my class rather is called my console my console yes dot cmd so this line has to be at the bottom of your script and all that it does is that make sure that you only execute this script when it is called this way if it is imported don't execute this code okay so that is the first few things that you need to do as soon as you start import this Create a class so you can put a pass inside here to not have an issue. Maybe I should, this one, I think I can write the code for it. So let's, let's create one, save this as, um, a b and b dot p y. Okay. Airbnb.py. So what I said is that first you should import import uh, CMD. Then after importing CMD, create a class, a class called. So we said my sorry my console my console. Then let it inherit from CMD a class called CMD. Then I can write pass in order to not cause any error. Then I'm going to check 
if it is called by name is equal to underscore underscore mean underscore underscore this and if it is equal to that that is only when i will execute the cmd loop okay so for those of you who did the shell project <laughs> for those of you who did the shell project one thing you remember is that we had to create a loop for the shell okay so that it is constantly in a loop showing a prompt for somebody to enter something execute after execution it shows the prompt so this cmd loop method of the cmd class is what is responsible for that so if you ignore this your program is not going to run the way you want it to run this is what will ensure that at every point in time there is a prompt for a user to ent enter something and after they've entered it it will bring up a new prompt all right by default when we run this program i i believe it should work let me clear and make this executable cmd mod plus fbmb okay clear hide this then so now let's run airbnb okay expected token import command not found syntax error near expected token this class my console what's, what's happening oh what is this thing doing Good day, sir. Yeah, good day. Could, could you Top try? Uh, How are you doing? Day. Yeah, could you try adding parentheses after my console? Come again. Oh, could you try oh, adding oh, oh, and oh, oh, open oh, and close oh. parentheses after after my console before the door. All right. Sure. Thank you. All right. We're still having the same issue let me let me quickly look at what i did here what different thing imports then why is it not working doc doc could you please zoom in a little i'm having a time seeing it because i'm using a mobile phone um, Okay, sure. Let me let me try zooming in. Uh, zoom, 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 zoom. Oh, God. There's no preference here. Does Control Plus work for you? Try it. to zoom. I think I was trying, but it wasn't giving me an outcome. Uh, it's not working. So or is it working? Can... About the shebang. You can go to settings. Oh, okay, that's fine. It's oh, working. yeah, it's fine. Well, thank you, sir. Okay, you're welcome. Oh. Interesting. I will I start a program and I forget to even add this. Then, hey, this one too looks scattered <laughs> in front of me. I, I'm struggling to find my place here. Uh, okay, so let's run it again. Hopefully, this time around. Okay, <laughs> so how did I, hey, good. So basically the reason it wasn't working was, I wasn't, I, ideally it could have even worked without this, but then I would have called it with, uh, how do you call it? Python three before mentioning the name. So what I wanted to show you is the default implementation 
this is the prompt. The prompt is called CMD. So we can change the prompt with an attribute of that class called prompt. So what it means is that if you go and check this CMD class inside the CMD model that has been created, there is a, a class attribute called prompt. And that is what is set to this. So if I set it to anything else, say uh, this, say this, okay? Or maybe this. Then it means that when I run this code, When I run this code again, you see my prompt. But then you can't do any of these if you don't know about the CMD model. So we would have to go and read on the CMD model to appreciate. Hey, good. <laughs> hey, <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> see, I shouted on my other screen. I ended up opening the internet <laughs> so i thought it was showing here anyway uh i want to bring up a okay let me bring this up all right uh so there is there is a site called python model of the week yes python model of the week dot com there is an abbreviation p y m o t w dot com slash three slash cmd that's where i learned about the model so for those of you who are interested you can go read about that model from there the site is this hey, you didn't copy uh where are you at? okay The site is this. Great. So it's PY representing Python. Then model of the week dot com. Make sure you choose the three, not the Python two, three, then CMD. So when you go there, you will get the, the details about the available methods and things. But one important thing that we need to know is that for this particular implementation, the methods that begin with the word do underscore are commands that can be executed. So if I create a method, say do PLD. If I create a method like this, let me go into the console. Let's do that. Uh, bring this down. Here, forget this. Let's create a method called do remember all the methods that have do underscore preceding them they are commands that you can issue when you run your console so do underscore pld whatever i want it to do then you pass self you pass self and another thing you could call it anything ask but mostly line for the line that was read then when this is brought in what should we do so i can say print we are having a pld what this means is that if i close this and run it again run it again then i do pld remember i didn't use do underscore pld it has been implemented that the command that people would type here is the same as the method that begins with do underscore p, uh, that, that command name. So if I go ahead and run this, it says we are having a POD. So I basically created a command that does something. And all that you need to do is to add it to this. So if you need to create a command that says create, and it should do something with create, let's say that for this command, if I say create, it should print, I have created 
whatever you gave me. Okay. So if I say create, say I have created, what did you pass to me? Uh, maybe you passed whatever you passed. Okay. So I save this. I need to rerun this program. Clear this. Okay. Run it again. Now create. What do I want to create? A book. So create book. And it says I have created book. Okay. So at the end of the day, anything that a person passes, you are now going to implement it. And remember that when it comes to the current work that we are working on, we have built a backbone somewhere that does all the things. So all that we need is to call an instance and call a method on the instance. And it will go and trigger that action that we want to take place. So for now, you just need to know how the CMD model works and how to use it. And that is what I'm showing you. So I have everything that they pass. What happens is that the first thing that they write here becomes the name of the method. Then the next thing they write, every other thing they write here will be passed in as a string inside line. So if I close this, I shouldn't even have closed it, and run it again. If I run this and I say create, then uh, this is my story. And I enter this, it says I've created, this is my story. So every other thing after this, after the method that you created, okay, what I will call the command, after the command that you have, will be passed as a string here in this argument. And this argument can be called anything. So I can call it um, <coughs> ax, k ax, like anything you want <laughs> to be. Well, the, I think the first resource I, I started reading, they were using line. So I've stuck to using line. Okay. So that's basically how to go about it. This means we can create as many methods as possible. There are, however, some, if I go ahead and I use, say, create dot something. Okay. So this is actually giving me because it's picking all of this. But then I want to uh, show something when we don't have creates. Okay, so the example that we have from the project we are dealing with is instead of saying create something, I'll say book then dot create something like this. And it's unknown centers dot create. So by default, but this program has not been, the CMD model has not been uh, configured to understand this. But then your current implementation, you need it to understand something like this. So there are some methods, class methods that we have to go and overwrite. And when we are able to overwrite that one, we'll be able to use our program as such. Okay. So let's take a look at some of those class methods that we may need to override. I've actually not understood all of them yet because I haven't tested all of them and I've shared the resource with you. So you can equally go and read on them. So some of the classes down here. Yes, so overriding base class methods. So some of these base class methods, you can override the CMD loop to do whatever you want to do. When we are done with a project, you can come around, I mean, you can start your own console program and play around with all of these things to know exactly what each of them does so that you appreciate the CMD model and you'll be able to use it anytime you want. So there is CMD loop that can be overridden. There is pre loop, post loop, pass line, one CMD, empty line, default, pre CMD, and the things. So personally, when I wanted to see how to override it, you read on, they tell you some of them that is not recommended to override, some that is recommended to override and things. So I just took one of them. For instance, here it says, each iteration through CMD loop cause one 
CMD, this method, to dispatch the command to its handler. So the first time I read this, I was like, okay, let me go and try one CMD out. Because it says that each iteration through it, that means anytime I enter something on the prompt, that's going to be an iteration through the, the program. So each iteration, this method is what will dispatch the command to its handler. So it means I can intercept this method. Okay, so let me override it. Intercept what was passed from the command line. Do whatever I want to do it uh, to it before I let it dispatch it to the handler. So that could easily be done. But then along the line to I am reading that is not the best for that. I mean, it's not the best thing to override this particular one. Even though in my initial implementation, that was what I used. The actual input line is passed with pass line to create a tuple containing the command. So those of you who did the simple shell project, you remember that after we have taken the, we have read the line from the uh, shell, we are going to pass it into strings, okay? In this particular case, we are passing it into a tuple. Then the rest to, to create a tuple containing the command and the remaining portion of the line. If the line is empty, then empty line is called. So this method will be called if the line is empty. The default implementation runs the previous command again. That's the default implementation of empty line. It runs the previous command again. Okay. So if I say that when there is an empty line, there is nothing there, it's empty, and I hit enter, I want to do something. That means that you have to override this particular method. Because by default, this method implements what the previous command. Then if the line contains a command, first, pre-CMD method is called, then the handler is looked up and invoked. So see what is happening. When, let's, let's go back to our board. What is happening here is that when the loop is set in place, okay, CMD loop is called. When it's set in place, the next thing that happens is one CMD. But when you look critically, there are a number of things that actually happen before this uh, one CMD. In fact, there is pre-loop, post-loop, and things. I think pre-loop should come before one CMD. I haven't actually seen it well, so I can't read that perfectly. But then the basic logic that I've gotten from what we just read is when the loop is started, when you start the loop, we pass whatever was put inside the command line. Okay, it's passed here. So let's say it's passed as line. Then this CMD, one CMD will pass it to what we call pass line then pass line will break line into a token. A token of, so it's going to give us, okay, let me write them below them. So this will give us, will pass line to pass line. Pass line will break line into a token of command and the rest of the line. So we'll have something like this coming from pass line. Then pass line, We'll check, what did they say there? Um, says, and the remaining portion, if the line is empty. So it checks if the line is empty. If it is empty, then it will go and call this. If it is not empty, then it calls spray CMD. So the next thing is spray CMD. So we have this passing spray CMD, passing the information to spray CMD. Then what will brace CMD do? Brace CMD is what is going to check. Let's go back. Brace CMD call then the handler is looked up. So brace CMD will look for the handler for this particular command that we have created and invoke the handler. If none is found, it will call default. Okay, and default, when you read about default, the one that retains the error messages. 
So basically what is going to happen is that Brace CMD is now going to take the command and check does this command exist. If the command exists, it's going to invoke invoke the command. But remember that the command, so it's going to invoke the command. But remember that the command is implemented this way, do underscore command. That's the name of the command. Then it will pass that line, that pass line gave it as an argument to this command or this method. Okay? And if this command that was given to it, it didn't find any uh, any method. So let me say method. If it didn't find any method that is going to use to invoke it, it will now pass the outcome to default. And default will, unless you have overridden default, it will throw the error. Does it make sense? So now we can intercept this loop at any point and override what each of them does. I started by trying to override this. It was giving me a few issues, even though I was able to do it, but then I feel probably that is not the best thing to do. It is until we have played with it very much that we will know exactly which one works best. So for now, I'm thinking of intercepting this. Okay? So how do I do that? When I come into my code, I just have to write a method called... So I create a method called pre-CMD. And this pre-CMD will obviously be receiving self and line. Okay? And when it receives line, what do I want to do with line? The default implementation is for it to return, it will return cmd.cmd.pre-cmd with line. So this is the default implementation, okay? This is the default implementation. So what it means is that now I haven't changed anything. So I can go ahead, let's start the program again, run this, and if I say create book again, it's going to give me, oh, what is the error? So I think CM to take only line, I guess so. Let's run it again. Create book. Hey, six one position argument, but two were given. How did I get two? Let me confirm that. So I should have even looked at the example they did over there, but then it doesn't spoil anything. Uh, CMD, CMD, where did I write here? One CMD, one CMD. Because I've zoomed into this thing, uh, do the strain, do all. Uh, okay, so it takes it takes those two. Why are we having the error? Self, then this. Or um, maybe the default implementation, I'm not doing it right. Let me check. Oh, so it should take the self as well. Okay, okay, okay. This is, I didn't even pay attention to something because the error message would have told me the line that the error was happening. All right, so I expect that now, even though I've written a, fund, a method Brace CMD. I haven't changed anything. It's a default implementation. For that matter, I expect that everything will work as if I don't have that method there. Okay, so when we run it and I say create book, it says I've created a book. Okay, now let's see something. If I come in here and I set line to be equal to, say, 
shoes. Let's exit this program, run it again. Then now call create book. Ooh. So the thing is, first of all, we need to understand how line comes. Line comes in, uh, was it? So relax. Let me print how line comes in here first. So that we know exactly how to override line. Line comes in here. Airbnb creates book. Okay, so this is how line is coming in. It's made up of two things. Okay, so what we can do to override it, now that we know it's going to come in this form, what you can do to override line, let me split it into two. Command and command and let's say add is equal to line dot splits so i'm splitting at where there is a space i'm splitting at where there is a space now i want to build a new line and say line is equal to uh f t uh, let's use an f string build a new line Command followed by, then I want to type shoes. Let me do something like this and see. So some of these things, you have to be playing with them to understand. Oh, <clears throat> sorry. Appreciate how they work. Create book. You see, I type in create book, but it's now giving me I've created shoes. Only because I have changed this to shoes. I've changed the line in here, okay? So what it means is that when you are calling this format, uh, say user.create, this format, and it's giving, sorry, it's because of this line, that's why it gave me that error. Uh, something like that. Let's run the program again. We said what user dot creates like this. Okay? And it's giving you unknown centers. Now you have to go in there and find out when you pass it, how does it actually pass the command? Okay. So you realize that here we are printing line, and this is line that was printed. It's printing it as user dot creates. But you know that that is not the format that we want line to be. We want line, when we call user.create, we actually mean we want it to become create user. Do you see that? This is what we want. So then we have to work on our line to get it into this format. So first of all, you have to set in a number of conditionals to check because people can use different ways. In fact, the easiest way, which I started with, but then I realized it wasn't robust enough, is to check if there is a dot inside the line that is passed. If dot in line, if dot in line, then I want to do something. I want to change how line comes. If there is no dot, then go ahead and use the default implementation. Okay? This is like the easiest thing. I mean, like the easiest way you would have thought about it in the first place. But then later, when you look at edge cases, somebody creating or updating email and things, you realize that it wouldn't work. Okay? So for now, let's, let's assume that that's what we want to achieve like, to help us get what we want to do. 
So if there is a line, a, a dot in there, we are assuming that the person is using it this way instead of saying create. What do we want to do? We want to split these two. We want to split it. So let's see. Or we could we could use replace. I think replace would be easier. So what we can do is to call replace online and say line dot replace. What are we replacing in line? We want to replace. We want to replace the dots with what? With a space, with an empty space. So by doing this. By doing that, what will happen is that our line will now become the then space creates. Then we'll still have the bracket. Okay. So I want to also replace these brackets. I want to replace this black bracket. I can do it in multiple ways, but the nice thing about Python objects is that you can continue to use the dot notation. So dot replace, what am I replacing? The opening bracket. What am I replacing it with? I'm replacing it with an empty string. So nothing in here. Then when I'm done there, to want to replace the subsequent one too. So I can call another replace. This is not like the best way. For those of you who have mastered uh, regular expressions, the best way will probably be using regular expressions. Okay. But then, for now, just so we may achieve the purpose we are looking for. Oh, you people should stop. <laughs> uh, I want to replace this with nothing. Okay. So let's see. Let me just intentionally run it, even though it may still end up giving us an error. Uh, just to see what our line is right now when we call it that way. So when we call it as user.creates, what do we have? Oh, it didn't do it, it didn't replace. If this in line, oh, what's happening? If this in line, oh, sorry, I need to reassign line. Okay, so I needed to reassign line. Uh, I forgot that. Let's run it again and say user dot creates run this and you see now we've been able to remove the full stop we've been able to remove the parentheses in front of it so all that we need to do is to split this into two and change their positions okay if i split this into two and change their position i now have create user and the code originally understands create user. So it will go and execute it for me. So I'll just come here and say, uh, I'm going to split, <laughs> I'm going to split this by line into two. Let me see the easiest way to do it. Uh, so a call line. Just so I'll make it clear for you to see. Let me say command. Okay. Oh no. Uh, line. Let me still use line. It's going to create a tuple of the line. Line is equal to line dot split. And where are we splitting? We are splitting at where there is a space. Okay. And we are going to print line again. Just to see how it's going to be presented. I... I'm looking forward to seeing it in a tuple or a list, one of them, a tuple or a list. Okay, so if we say user.creates, user.creates, we run it. Okay, it's giving us a list. It's giving us a list. So we have user and creates. Once we have this list, 
we can do something about the list, change their position, and form a new uh, what? Form a new line. So line is equal to our f string. Let's use f string to build our line. The first one is line at index one. Remember, sorry, I have to put it in curly braces. Yes. Remember that line at index one is create and line at index zero is the user. So we are building a new line. We are saying this at index zero. Oh, why did I keep you here? Okay, so put this here. Great. So now that we have this, let's go ahead and execute our code. If you have any questions, just post me and ask the question. I know it's becoming a lot right now, but then if you take your time and go through it, you will pick it. So let's call user.create, then pass this. And it says I've created a user. So now our code responds to create user. It responds to user dot a. Yes, user dot create in this form. And that's only because we overwrote or we changed the default implementation of Prey CMD. Okay. So if you also are interested in changing the default implementation of Prey CMD, then try playing around Prey CMD. Play around it, see exactly how uh, it works. And this is how you learn how it works. You print each of them that you receive. You print it to see what is the outcome. Okay, I want to change it to this format. So what should I do? Okay, so now the last bit that is a bit tricky, which I want to show then open the floor for questions, is that if you want people to be able to run your program from the console, that through piping, I mean, from this terminal, I should be able to run, give the program a code. So I say echo creates user, then I pipe it to your program. Airbnb, sorry. Then I run it. You see what it's doing to me right now. So it is not working. How do I get that to work? That's what we want to look at next. How do I get it to work such so that when you call it that way, the program is able to work? It's simple, actually. Uh, what we need to know about is the difference between, how will I say this? Whether, whether the um, output is coming from, whether it's coming from standard inputs or it's coming from the terminal, okay? So, there's, let me just go ahead. There is a simple command that we can use in Python. Let's implement. Uh, okay. So this basic command. Let me paste it here so that you all can see. And maybe when I share the PDF, you can have access to it. So to make the app work non-interactively, all that you have to do is to check if the system dot uh, system in is not a terminal. Okay, if it is not a terminal, that means that it's being passed through interactively. If there is no check like this, by default, your system will always go and check from the input from an input device like the keyboard okay so just by bringing this line inside your press cmd all that you are doing is that you should always check when the call the program is run you should first check if there is something like you are checking if 
they've been a command, but it's not coming from your keyboard. It is not coming from your keyboard. I just said print an empty space, then give me the rest, like go ahead and do the work, okay? So all I need to do is to add this to my code. Somewhere inside my code, where do we have the CMD here? Okay, so let's put it up here. Let's put it up here. We need to import the sys model to for it to work. So come here and import sys. After importing sys, now I should be able to run the code the way that I did earlier. Oh. What is wrong? Great user. I don't know why this is not working. Great user will be passed to this Airbnb and that should work. Why is it not working? Okay, so let me let me get rid of all, all these things to see why it's not working. But basically, that's all that you need to do for it to respond. Um, clear, run it again. Oh, End of file. Why is it giving me end of file? End of file. End of file. Let me just confirm what I did. Uh, did I do anything different? Oh my goodness. So I'll have to take time to figure it out. I don't know why it's behaving this way, but I really, you just need to add that line of code and it should work. I still don't understand why it's not working because I am echoing this create user. Then I'm piping it, I'm piping it to Airbnb. All right, so let me leave it here. Take your questions. I'll share the PDF with you so that you have that snippet of code. Yes, questions, if you have questions. So basically, I illustrated this thing. It, it works. I don't know why it's working. Right. Yes, any questions so far? Okay, um, well done, sir. So I checked, I checked them um, in yeah. ALX. Um, um, intranet now, and I think there is a space between the piping. I don't know what, if that's why it's not working. Maybe you can modify oh, I, it. I left space initially, it wasn't working. Okay, I really don't know that thing that's because this morning my own code is even running and it's the same implementation in my own code. I'll figure it out if, if there is any prominent thing, I'll let you all know via the group. I'll share it in a group. Yes, any other question? Okay, quick question. Um, yes, sorry, I, go I, ahead. I, I went off, um, I had an incoming call earlier when I was talking. I, I'm struggling to hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay, go ahead. Okay, cool. So my question has to do with, can you, um, wow. I, I, I can hear you. Like it's going down and down and down. But can when, you, when I can showed you, you my screen, yeah. Yeah, you know. When I showed you my screen, did you see it earlier on? I showed. I was trying yeah, to I show saw you the, from from models okay. uh, import storage. Yes. So, yeah, so how I import you have, exactly. use, you have to import. Yeah. Okay. I, okay. That's fine. Okay. Thank you so much. So the next, my You're my welcome. other question has to do with, um, we were my partner, my partner and I, and 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 some others, uh, were working on the. Um, 
what's it called the file storage and we go to the reload you know where you are deserializing i mean from uh, i mean basically from the file then you deserialize so you can store in the you can store in the <laughs> you can store in the class mm-hmm. uh, the class okay. attribute, yeah. the private class attribute. exactly and um essentially it's supposed to be the reverse but i found out after you have um, read from the file uh, into the into json.loads then it starts giving you this uh, uh, this error json.decoder json something else. oh and, okay uh-huh. for some reason and for some reason it's not able to I, I don't know it seems like i we need to do something extra for it to for you to converse from the json formatted string into the into the dict class you know before we can send it and uh i don't know if you could help out to help 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 me out with i mean get okay. the concept behind it what what is missing i don't know yeah thank you okay all right that's fine so i i, I actually feel your pain <laughs> The reason I say so is that I had a similar issue and my partner can bear me witness that that reload part took us a very long time. Like I built it initially, it was working. Then after some time, I think when I got into, that was around tax five. It was giving me the right outcome. I went through to like, I was at tax 18 or so, and I realize now that tax five, the representation is wrong. It's like, I built this thing, it was working. So I came back to it to come and check. I checked everything, like everything I've done, I think that is it. But then I'm still having the same issue. But previously it was working too. So what has changed? What has changed? I didn't know. So I went to the extent of going to revert my code back to the commit before that because unfortunately when i did tax five i didn't commit my code i only committed it after tax six and when i reverted to the commit after tax six it was still giving me the same error so i had to revert back to tax uh, three and four commit then build it from there and I ended up getting the same error. So it was quite tough. That's why I'm saying that I, I understand what you are saying. But then I don't really remember the exact thing that changed the whole thing. So here, this is the nasty thing I did to solve this problem. <laughs> so basically, we, we are trying to create put everything into a dictionary, then pass it to the object that we have created so that when they print it out, it will print the string representation of that object, okay? Because you realize that if you don't do it right, it's going to print out just the dictionary that you created. So it was a bit tough. Here, I called the object dictionary that has been loaded. So I'm saying that when you load the data, I explained already with the help of json.load. When you load a uh, data from a JSON file, Python with the help of json.load will automatically convert it to a Python dictionary object. So I'm going into this dictionary object and I am picking the key and the value. But then this particular dictionary object appears in this format the key is the id that's the class name dot id if only you have implemented it you understand those of you who haven't implemented it yet when you are doing you would you would appreciate it then the other part is also a dictionary so i now i need to grab the class name come again i'm saying it's like a dictionary i need to grab the class name I mean, I'm sorry, like, I'm struggling to hear you sorry, again. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Is it, can you hear me now? Hello? Can you hear me now? 
No, I'm struggling. Can you hear me now? Okay, I could hear that. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Um, I was saying... Uh, what, what, what were you what, saying? Mm-hmm. I was saying... So, first and foremost, you have to obviously read the file, right? I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I want, I just want to go yes, through the, yes. the process, right? You first have to read the file. Yes. And, it, and base the, the, the content is a JSON formatted string. I mean, it's a class string. Yes. And, uh-huh. Yes. Okay. Then from there, okay, uh-huh, from there, that's, that's where, that's where I got stuck. <laughs> that's where. So, after, after you've loaded it, it comes into this, like you've created a Python object. Okay. So just yeah. say it as an object. This object happens to be in the form of a dictionary. So you need to go inside it. The way that I figured it out was first to print this object and see how it actually came. Exactly. Exactly. So that exactly. once I know how the object looks like, I know, okay, what do I want to do with this object? Okay. So I realized that in that specific object you have the id which is like the base model dot something or user dot something then i mean user dot an id then a dictionary that contains the details about that given instance so i walk in there and there is an attribute inside this particular dictionary that we added when we were serializing called underscore underscore class. And that gives you the name of that class. So I quickly picked the name of the class. There, it may not be necessary, but in my case, it was necessary because I was going to use the name of the class to do something. Okay. Okay. So what was I going to use the name of the class to do? I was going to call the name of the class here. We assigning this. So remember, I created an empty dictionary here that I'm trying to use to go and put the details in. So this, I'm giving a key ID here and I want to generate that. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> you know, we have, we have implemented a class already go in here this one okay let, let me see let me show you how i came by this okay, okay uh-huh. at the end of the day i wanted to achieve something like this i wanted to achieve something like this final underscore dict that's the dictionary that i'm creating yeah the the key will be the id then the value of this dictionary is going to be something like this model then I'll pass a dictionary to this model. Okay. I'll pass a dictionary to this model. Okay. And when you go back to your implementation of the base model class, yeah. you realize that inside the init class, yeah. we checked I if they pass the ID, then unpack it. Yeah. Okay? Mm-hmm. To create the instance. So basically, I just needed that init call on a class, but then it could be of it could be any class at all. It could be a user class, it could be a base model class, it could be any of the classes. So it was a bit dicey over there, file storage here. So I couldn't just have called base model like that. And even though I know the name of the class, I've picked it here. Okay, the name of the class. If I put it here, or even if I evaluate it and put it here, initially that was what I was doing. I was evaluating this. So I'll do something like eval. Then I'll pass the class name to it. That should ideally work, but then it returns this as a string. And the next problem is that if you are calling it this way, you need to have imported this model. That means that I have to import every of the models that I'm going to be creating. No, sorry. Every of the classes that I'm going to be creating inside this file storage. I have to be importing them to have access to each of them like that. Okay. So 
to work around it smartly, I decided not to import them directly, but create a class, uh, sorry, create a method that I'll call classes. And inside that method, I will import all of them. So that import will only take place when something is called, okay? Because I was getting an error when I was trying to call them individually. I was getting an error that said something about circular importation of the model, okay? So to revert that problem, I came into this and created a class. Created a class called classes. And inside these classes, I am importing all of the other classes that I've created from models. Then I created a dictionary that will retain each of the class that I've imported for me. So basically all that I've done with this line of code here, this line of code down here, self.classes. Remember that classes is a method that I created that retains a dictionary. So this is essentially retaining a dictionary of all my classes that I have. And I am passing the key class name. So if this specific class that we have gotten, the instance that we have gotten is from class base model, the key here is base model. So at the end of the day, I'm going into this dictionary, which is here, this dictionary over here, okay? I'm coming into this dictionary and I'm looking for the key base model. And this key base model will retain the class base model. You see? So essentially, I end up with base model here. And I have passed the dictionary to base model. That's all. That's what I did here. Then now I reassign the file storage uh, private, I think it was a private attribute to the final object so that anywhere it is being used and being printed, we are getting the actual object details in the string representation of it. I don't know if that makes sense. I know if you haven't done it, it wouldn't make sense. And myself, if I am to just look at it like this, it will still won't make sense to me. But then it's because I walked through it, I had the problem, tried figuring it out. The, the, the nice thing about programming, debugging your code, teaches you a whole lot of things, okay? So the best thing you do is try printing at each step, like how I was showing when I was doing the console model thing. Each step. If, if you've not figured it out, just print that thing and see what the outcome is. And see, is it what I am looking for? What can I do about this? Then you continue like that. I hope that is helpful. Um, okay, can you, please can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. So, um, uh, okay, so I'm, I'm trying to follow, honestly, I'm trying to follow because um, basically, what we were doing was that um, because we were told um, Python as a circle is. I think not... the voice is going now again. Okay, sorry. And because I would. That, uh, yes, speak aloud so that the others too can hear. The others too can hear. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll yeah. try to maintain the same volume. Um, so, basically, what we were doing was um, uh, because the set Python as a circle is similar, we, I mean, we go in the try to understand the concept because Python as a circle broke it down, you know, they broke it down. So we were, I mean, that's how we used, that's, that's what we did to figure out. I, I was actually doing same too. Exactly. So that's what we did to figure out the save and it was very, it became very clear. But so what we'll do is at each point in breaking down the process, cause say for instance, that's like about two or three processes before. The, the voice is gone again. Sorry. <laughs> Say, for instance, has about two or uh, three processes before it can even save into the file. So I can't hear. I, I hope I'm not the only one. The reload, the or is it from my end? And essentially, when we got the base, yeah, we can't hear him, dog. We can't hear him. Yes, Kwabena, it's, it's difficult to hear what you're saying. Things inside of the file. So I'll definitely have to open my read. We can't hear you. Wow. Like, uh, 
Is it is it your mad piece or what? We still we are struggling to hear you, frankly. Uh, because uh, when we run it, okay. So from there, I basically. Uh, I don't think he can hear you as well. Interactive mode. Just because, just Please keep talking. Kwabila, <laughs> Kwabila, can you hear me? After breathing from the farm. Hi, Kwabila. Hi. Yeah, so it looks like he cannot hear me. Kwabila, we can't hear you. Hi, hi, Kwabila. Wave your hand so that you understand. I don't even know if he... Hi, Kwabila. Kwabila, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Nothing. Sorry. Can, can you hear me? It's, it's still no, too no, faint. Wow. But if any other person has a question to kindly bring it up, we are about to close with past two hours, Mark. Yes, Kwabina. Yeah, uh huh. So I, I, I was saying when after you have passed, uh, after you have read from your JSON file, it seems mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a string. And I tried using the uh, JSON dot loads to convert it into a dictionary, but it wouldn't. Why? Why not? I don't know. Because I, you did you see how I implemented it here? Uh, here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. As soon as I got the JSON dot loads to pick the file that I've picked, uh -huh. read it from it. It is an object. Okay. <clears throat> so now that is why I could come and do for ID and dictionary in this dot items this wouldn't happen if it was a string string hmm. okay okay that's fine i'll i'll, yes. I'll try and implement again and i'll just give you feedback all right time. sure we are in the group so anytime you need help you can always reach out sure. any any other person any sure, question thanks. thank you welcome Uh, hello, doctor. Hi, hi. Uh, concerning the private attributes, five parts. Okay. Are we to just pass the file name, or we are going to pass the um the full part to the five part attribute? Oh, just. I think even the question made it clear. I like, it's it's a string, so just write the string there. When it will look at what you have written there to create it. So if you pass, uh, I haven't tried with an absolute path, but I'm sure if you pass an absolute path, it will go and create it in the location that you pass it. So if you pass it just file.json, it will create file.json in there for you. So I believe that's how it's supposed to be done. Uh, okay, which means if I want to create the file in another place, that's when I should um, specify the absolute path, right? Exactly, exactly. That's what I believe. I haven't tried it before, but I believe that should work. So when I said JSON dot file, it automatically creates the JSON dot file here. Uh, where is it? Uh, file dot JSON. Sorry, did I say JSON or file? So these are the examples I've been dealing with. Okay, JSON file is not easy to read when you have it in the data like that. Okay. So for those of you who be testing out your course to see whether it's working or not, there are a lot of JSON formatters online. So just go online, search for JSON formatter, pick any of them, and paste the JSON code that you had in there. When you paste it in there, it will format it in a way that uh, makes sense. I mean, easier to see. So after you update something, see, there's an example that I've been doing. And if, let me paste the new one I just copied in here. So this is after it has beautified it for you. So now you can see that this is one data or one instance in our case. This is one instance. And this belongs to the base model class. This is the ID is created at this, uh, the attributes, this, that's that this is user instance 
So that at the end of the day, when you are implementing your counts function, you can come and see, okay, how many user models do I have here? One, two, there are two of them. Then you go and check if there are really two of them. Okay. So make good use of these tools. Any other question? Yeah, Obed. Uh, Doctor, sorry, I have a question. Hi. So my question Hi, is sure, called the uh, code uh, base question. I noticed some uh, double aesthetic in your codes. Like, what yeah, are yeah, they supposed yeah. to do? For the dictionary. Function? Okay. Uh, okay, so For you're passing dictionary. it as a keyword, yeah. keyword arguments. Exactly. All right, all right, all right. You'd have to specify that for it to go in that way. All right, all right. Thanks. So, you're welcome. Uh, Doctor, Doctor where's that code? Yeah. So, this is what he was referring to. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Obed. Uh, uh, Hi. Here again. Yeah, so, I mean, if, if you want to format your json file there there are i mean in vs code for instance i mean there's a json formatter please that, I mean, speak up eh? still i think it's mine i'm saying if you want to format mm -hmm. your json file into json okay. uh, form, uh, there's there's an i mean like you can either install a json formatter or use btr code in vs code i mean okay it's, okay so you, okay so you don't have okay so, you just, you, so it's, a, it's simply a matter of selecting it and and when you right click okay you say um in format format selection with i mean you can try it right now yeah format okay, selection okay. with okay yeah this so language this language okay. yeah, code. yeah that's it that's all it. right thank you for sharing that i didn't know yeah. thank you You're so welcome. much You're okay so that is good so now you don't need to go and use the online formatters you format it in here except for those who are still using vi hi hi to all of you i salute all of you even Vim has a plugin that can do this for you as well. <laughs> okay. That, that's why I'm saluting you people because you people, you are no, the I'm best. No, I'm not one of them. Oh, please, thank you. Okay. Uh, you're also running away. <laughs> I mean, I'm a nano person. I don't, I don't like Vim. Thank you. Hey, you are a nano person. So I salute yeah. you too. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes, any other question? Otherwise, I think... We'll bring our session to an end. Any questions? I would have loved to do more, but more can land me in problems. So I hope this is good power, enough. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I hope this is Hello, good Mr. enough. Doctor, it gives you a... You will be sending the PDF, yes. right? The PDF, yes. I'm sending the PDF. And hopefully by tomorrow morning, the video will be available on YouTube as well. Okay. Yeah. Great. Maybe, maybe sometime in the future we'll get to. In fact, let me let me let me give this word of advice. This is a very big project. To me, I like this project compared to all the others that we have built. Okay. Because this is like something unique. Why do I say so? We can use the same concepts we've used here to build an application for ourselves. So try and understand. There's feedback coming from someone. So now you're unmuted. I don't know if it is coming from your side, but there is feedback from. Yes, so you are the only one muted. Sana. Kindly can, can you mute yourself. Oh, okay. Let me mute you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. So, um, what I was saying was that after this project, the experience that you get, you can actually use... Let me move away from this thing. You can actually use the experience you get from this project to build your own project. It could be anything. Now you know how to use the CMD. So if you want to build a calculator, you can build a calculator that works via CMD. If you want to build a, the back end of a website, you can build that. And pretty soon, I think from next week, we are learning SQL to look at how we would attach a database to this 
uh, code that we have written instead of going to the JSON file. JSON file, managing JSON file is not easy. Managing it when we have it in uh, SQL, I mean, we have it in a database file, is much easier. And therefore, we'll learn that and we upgrade. Okay, so we are going to build on this project till we've built a full clone of Airbnb. And by the time you've built a full clone of Airbnb, we can say that you are a full stack developer or engineer for that matter, because you have tackled yes. every aspect. Now we've in. looked at but, um, the sorry. database. Yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I yeah, can hear. So, um, this is the first project that we are building that you can actually show people, right? Exactly. You couldn't show anybody exactly. your printf. You couldn't show anybody no. your simple shell. But the, the question they ask you is, is why, why, why did you have to recreate printf? Because it's already as is. Nobody is going to use your printf. No way. You get. Even your shell. Like, why will I leave Bash and come and use your shell? So those ones were for learning purposes, but then this is like a practical, uh, a practical project. Okay. And you're going for job interviews. These are the type of projects that you can show. With my knowledge in Python, I've built this. I built an Airbnb clone, the back end of an Airbnb clone and interfaced it with a console application. This is it. And uh, maybe by that time you would have done your SQL part. But if you haven't done your SQL part, having knowledge of working with file storage too is excellent. So you work with file storage, you have that knowledge as well. You can share that. But then let's not only rely on this project. Because the issue about relying on this project is that a lot of people have done it. A lot of people have done it. It's available on GitHub. So how sure am I that you didn't go and copy the same code and present to me? If let's say you are looking for a job and the only project that you can point to is this particular project that is in your GitHub account, how sure am I that you didn't copy it from somewhere? Unless if I, I want you to walk me through it and you can easily walk me through it, but then people won't usually have that time. So out of the knowledge that we get from here, let's try and make something unique. It could be very simple. It could be the same model, base model, the same class. Don't call it Airbnb. Call it anything. Your, your own hotel website that you are building. Load it back to GitHub. You created your own hotel website. People could book rooms. People could create accounts in your hotel and things. Then eventually when we start doing the front end part two, you weave something like that into it. You build your own hotel application. Can even end up selling it to a hotel if you love money like some of us do. Anyway, thank you so much for joining. I appreciate your time being with us. Hopefully, next week we'll resume our PLDs and we'll have to learn about exceptions. Hey, I didn't talk about testing. <laughs> I didn't talk about testing. So testing is a very important thing. Please and please and please again, go and learn on... Uh, Learn on unit test model. Let me quickly paste it in the PDF so that you can have access to it. Uh, where did I write this? Okay, sure. It's, it's not, I mean, it's not a lot, but, and some of you know it already, except that uh, it may be a reference point for some of you as well. So, testing. Go here. Uh, say testing with unit test model. Then let me paste this. Okay. So I'll share it with it. It's not a lot, as I said, but then it may give you some information. Probably you know it already. Right? Okay. <laughs> So let's learn about testing. Recently, I watched an interview on YouTube. I think it's a Ghanaian that was being interviewed and he has been working with Amazon for, hey, sorry, Microsoft for the past three years. And what I heard was that as a software engineer, he works in a testing department. So all they do, their day in activity is just building tests for the developer apps that Microsoft produces. 
Okay. So it means that this is equally important. You could be employed as a software engineer that is involved in testing. We have different types of testing. There are some testing that is not for software engineers, but at least unit test is for software engineers. Uh, integration test as a software engineer, you may be involved in it. And some of us, no, let me not say some of us, okay, us, all of us. I mean, some of us may be interested in working in startups. And for that matter, you'd have to be doing most of these things yourself. If you want to also become a founder, build your own company, like I want to do, you would be able, you should be able to do all of these things by yourself. Especially if you are going to be managing people, you should be aware so that when your subordinates are making mistakes, you can direct them. Thank you all for being here and I'll see you in our next session. Bye-bye. When, when is our next session?